Hi, this is Claudia Frühling from Java Magazine. I'm sitting here in Frankfurt with Ed Burns from Oracle. Hi. Hello. Um, Ed is the specification lead of JSF, um, and he had the time to come to us before he leaves to Nuremberg. So, Ed, um, the server side quoted you with, not every release has to be a blockbuster release, right. but um, JSF 2.2 is about to be um, ready. In a few weeks, the review, um, the public review draft will be ready. So, how do you feel right now? Oh, uh, pretty good. It's been a, um, a lot of features that have gone in, and the uh, longer you take between releases, the more pressure there is to make it a real big blockbuster release. Um, but I think we're pretty happy with the feature set that we have coming in. And, uh, you know, as I've been saying uh, to the public and um, blogs and interviews, <clears throat> 2.0 was a very big release. It kind of went with Java E6, and uh, 2.2 is more of an incremental thing. So, um, you know, I'm happy with how it's at. Cool. JSF is more than 10 years old now. Right. Um, how long have you been working with JSF? How did it all start? Well, I started working on it in um, 2001 on the uh, reference implementation. And uh, back then, this was JSF 1.0, and we were just getting started. Um, and the landscape back then was, you know, Struts was the big de facto web framework standard, or, you know, de facto standard. And um, I started working on the reference implementation, <clears throat> and Craig McClanahan was the spec lead of JSF at that point. Uh, but towards the end of uh, 1.0, um, I decided to uh, step up and help uh, be a co-specification lead. And eventually, when uh, Craig decided to move on to uh, another venture, um, I became the, the spec lead. And so moving from the reference implementation, but it's always been a, a very small team working on JSF you know, at Sun and then at Oracle. Um, we've always been very open to collaborate with uh, the expert group and also with the um, wider community. I don't know if many people know this, but JSF was the first part of any Java stack to be open sourced. Before JDK, before any other Java EE, the, JS the JSF was the first project that actually got the OK to go into the open source license. Now back then, before we went to GPL, it was CDDL, Common uh, Developer and uh, demonstration license, I'm not exactly sure, CDDL is what it was. Um, and it was an OSI approved, Eric Raymond sanctioned um, open source license. Uh, but I'm, I'm bringing that out to demonstrate that even though it's been a small team working on it inside of Sun and later inside of Oracle, um, you know, three to five people, uh, uh, developers, um, we've often had a lot of help from the community. That's pretty cool. So if you were there from the start, um, do you have any milestones how the JSF evolve and change um, in these years? Sure. Uh, we've evolved a lot, but we've also stayed true to our original uh, mission, which is uh, to have a server-side integration point where your user interface logic uh, resides on the server and sends the um, pretty much simple HTML with maybe islands of JavaScript and things that are uh, for more um, interactive components, but not true, you know, business logic lifecycle residing on the client. We've kept that on the server. And so even though we've been developing it for so long, we've stayed true to that original mission. So um, let me just look at my notes here, uh, time-wise. We had uh, JSF 1.0 in 2004, uh, and then we followed up quickly thereafter with another release of 1.1. Uh, then we waited for two years and, well, actually didn't wait, we kept working on it, but the next one that came out was uh, JSF 1.2 in 2006. And then uh, 2009 is when we finished up JSF 2.0, that's the big one that I mentioned. And now uh, here it is, uh, 2012, and we're finishing up uh, JSF 2.2. Good. You define six big ticket features for JSF 2.2. Right. Um, one of them would be faces flows. Right. Um, I understand it's like a standard for building wizards and, and this sure. stuff. Um, can you tell a bit about, about this feature and how it got influenced by other technologies like Spring Webflow and ADF task flows? Sure. Um, it's an important thing to note with uh, prior to this feature, faces flows in JSF 2.2, the unit of abstraction for JSF was the page. So if you had a large JSF application, it would be like having um, you know, a 20,000 line C program all in one function. 
and you're just kind of having to maintain complexity using go-to statements. And clearly, that doesn't take advantage of the lessons that we've learned in computer science since the 1960s. So with JSF 2.2, finally we have some kind of um, a better level of abstraction where you can group pages together and uh, they share a common scope uh, that is an actual um, memory uh, scope. Uh, we're using CDI as the scope mechanism for this because that's in the platform. And uh, you can group the pages together and define the relationship between the pages and then have a higher level of abstraction. So instead of navigating between pages only, you can take a step up and you're navigating between flows. So you're in a flow that deals with checkout and then you finish with that and then you go to another flow that is returned to the shopping flow and then you can navigate and do some more shopping for example and then put things in your um, Varen Korb, your uh, shopping basket and uh, you know go back and forth between the different flows and it lets you um, think about things at a higher level rather than just putting everything together in one gigantic um, directory structure. Now, in point of fact, when people use JSF in production, they end up inventing their own flow thing because you have to have some kind of uh, modular system. Uh, but this looks at uh, the state of the art uh, and puts it into the standard. That's why uh, standards take a long time because they um, are looking at the best practices and then trying to integrate them into the specification in a way that makes sense um, because everyone does their things slightly differently. Like the way flows are defined in ADF task flows is a little bit different to how they're defined in Spring Web Flow. Uh, different syntax, different rules, slightly different, right? Um, so the challenge is taking those different uh, ideas and putting them together in a way that makes sense. So um, what I'd like to see is if you have an application that's built on top of ADF task flows, you have a straightforward migration to go into the JSF spec if you want to upgrade your JSF spec. And the same is true with uh, Spring Web Flow. And this is why I really am uh, happy with the job that I have because um, it lets me get a chance to talk to VMware and talk to uh, the people. Um, well, another one we looked at was My Face is Cody. Um, talk to all these different people and get their ideas and put them in. Very cool. Another feature would be HTML5 friendly markup. Um, you said it is the motherhood and apple pie of web apps. That's, that's very cool. Um, can you tell us a bit about this feature? Sure. Uh, when I said the motherhood and apple pie of web apps, I mean um, these kind of things that every application has to have, whether it's explicitly handled at the framework layer or at the application layer or not. Um, you might not <clears throat> be localizing your application. You might be saying, OK, my application is only going to be written for people in uh, French, for example. But if you don't um, take the step of putting things in resource bundles, then you know, you're still making a decision to uh, localize. You're just choosing to not localize, right? Um, another one is uh, persistence. You know, every application has to have some kind of persistence solution. So if you're just doing something quick and dirty um, with some hash maps and uh, Jack's B to pull data out of XML, <clears throat> That's one way, but if you're going to go and scale it up, you might need to have something like JPA or Hibernate. Um, so <clears throat> where HTML fits into this is it's one of the other things that you have to have in any web application. Um, if you're going to deploy it to lots of web browsers, um, it has to run in a standard HTML way. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, this feature kind of lets us um, acknowledge that page authors, when they write their HTML, they prefer to do it just, you know, without these funny kind of tags. Um, the way JSF development is, you have these tags, and they uh, represent um, like one little simple tag, like a P colon uh, calendar picker, or a, um, a rich faces calendar picker. Uh, it appears as one tag in the page, but when you render the thing, it actually turns into a whole bunch of HTML and JavaScript and CSS uh, that is sent to the client side. Well, that model works fine for um, page developers who are comfortable with that, but pure HTML authors, they would rather know that they're going to control how things are rendering. They want to make sure that uh, they're using 
the markup that they expect. So with this feature, you can write regular HTML and just throw a few uh, JSF attributes in there to say, okay, this component really is a JSF component, and uh, it lets it get picked up on the server side. So to get back to this motherhood and apple pie um, analogy, it lets you use JSF for what it's good for, which is the server side processing, the validation, the conversion, the you know integration with persistence, the um, localization, all of these things that JSF has had for a, a long time because that's the idea. Um, but yet, author it with a pure HTML way of doing things. I had a look at the issue tracker of JSF 2.2 on Friday, and multi-templating was on hold. What is about this feature? Okay, well, multi-templating uh, was a feature that was uh, really kind of an interesting feature that was uh, suggested by uh, Lamine Ba and the Java community. And, uh, you know, he contributed the idea of that. Um, but we looked at the feature and we decided to scale it back a little bit, but we're keeping the essentials of the feature. So rather than calling it multi-templating, uh, we've decided to look at what it really is, uh, what we're going to use it for, and we've renamed the feature to resource library contracts. And really, it's a way to <clears throat> say that you have a collection of facelet template files. And uh, if you can package those up into a reusable module, uh, then if you want to let a page author use those templates, what do you need to know? Uh, you need to know what are the names of the templates. You need to know what are the facelets insertion points on there. So um, that constitutes a usage contract. So that's what we've renamed the uh, feature as resource library contracts. But we still have the feature. Uh, it's just been kind of renamed. Um, also, this contract that I mentioned is a very informal thing. There's no special file that says, OK, these are the insertion points and these are the templates. Um, it's really like you have to know kind of what's inside it in order to use it. Um, but for most people, that's just fine. You know, uh, we don't need to be so specific with what is a contract. And I kind of look at it in comparison with the JSF 2.0 feature, composite components. This feature has um, a way to declare a component, and it does have a very strict contract. You have this interface section which says, these are the actions that I support, these are the listeners that you can attach to me, um, these are the kind of events that I emit. Uh, you know, the component declares what it can do, um, and that's pretty formal. With this resource library contracts feature, it's not as formal. It's just, okay, I know that there's a template called sidebar, and I can include it, and I know that that template has three different insertion points, maybe the title and the content pane and a footer, for example. But it's completely flexible as to how you want to define it. At WJAX, we always have a traditional JSF track um, at JAX as well. We're just about to start planning it. Um, Andy Bosch is moderating it, and he said a lot of people ask about the combination of JSF and JavaScript, actually. Right. So um, how is it possible at the moment? Is there something? Well, this is another thing why I think accounts for the longevity of JSF. Um, if you look at JSF not so much as a product, but rally, really as an abstraction, that can explain why it's been around for so long. Because JSF really is just a way of organizing your web application so that you can put your, you know, your template files in this place, and you have your JavaScript files, and here's how they get delivered to the client. And what they do on the client is not really a concern so much of the JSF framework. So for example, this is why uh, the Prime Faces component library has been able to be so successful, because they're able to integrate um, jQuery and other JavaScript frameworks to provide that really uh, interactive, rich experience, but yet they're still living inside the uh, JSF uh, model as far as how you author the pages. You know, I talked about earlier the um, using of tags to uh, represent complex pieces of uh, markup, um, well, um, it puts all of that JavaScript stuff under the covers. So um, I think that's uh, you know, a pretty well understood way to do it. Um, but we also are aware of the fact that browsers are getting uh, much more capable uh, with HTML5 being so prevalent, um, it's starting to be possible <clears throat> to have a different programming model where you're putting your business logic and, and you're, you're putting your UI logic and some of your business logic onto the client and uh, using JSON and REST to send the queries from the client to the server and then your server side 
has less to do with the user interface logic and more to do with you know, your persistence and your uh, CDI and your beans and stuff. And that program, programming model is something that we explored with the uh, Project Avatar, which uh, we showed at Java 1. And um, it's uh, just a technology demonstrator to show um, that we are aware of the change of uh, focus, uh, but yet it's still um, going to be a kind of world where you have UI logic on the server and, you know, starting to move to more on the client. It's not um, one approach is the best. It really is look at your problem and which solution works best for you. And JSF 2.2 um, will be part of Java E7. Right. And it's scheduled for April 2013. Um, a part of the, um, from the JSF um, stuff, what would be a highlight for you uh, at Java E7? I would say uh, JAXRS 2.0 is to uh, Java EE 7 what JSF 2.0 is to Java EE 6. It's kind of, uh, of all the JSRs, the one that has the biggest, you know, uh, amount of things that are new. And uh, I'm not going to go into detail about what their new features are. There's a lot of great content out there about it. Uh, but yet, that framework, uh, that technology has been um, due for an update for a long time. And now that this is the this is this is their blockbuster release. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great week in Germany. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.